You could go down to a bank in Pompeii or to London, the great Roman cities, or Vienna, another great Roman city. You could deposit it in a CD and get 6%. Can you do that today? Can you? No. And if you were bolder, you could go into these joint stock corporations and make maybe 100% profit if everything went right. And a patriotic middle class. For the emperors understood they were tolerant. And in fact, Roman emperors built the great temples that you see along the Nile today in honor of the gods of Egypt. They built temples in honor of the Celtic gods. You could plead your case in Syriac or in Celtic or in Punic in a Roman court. So they were tolerant. It was a multicultural, diverse empire. And yet the Roman emperors also believed that no empire, no nation will long endure if it is not bound together by a common set of moral values. And they were the moral values of classical Greece. And the Roman emperors became the great standard bearers of the civilization of Greece. It was an age so peaceful that the Roman emperor Tacitus, a great favorite of both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, complained in the second century AD that there was nothing interesting to write about. There were no wars the way they had been in the great days of the Republic. So an empire of peace and prosperity and a global economy. In fact, most terrifying of all thoughts for you, your wife wants to redecorate the house and she takes you down to the interior decorator. And the interior decorator has a whole handbook and you say, I want marble, I want marble all over my dining room. Well, you're already getting a little worried, right? And he begins to flip through and you say, oh, wait a minute. That beautiful yellow marble. Oh, you have the most exquisite taste, Mrs. Publius. Uh, it's expensive, though. It's cut in North Africa. Let's say you're in, uh, in Rome. It's cut in North Africa. Oh, well, maybe we better look for something else. Do you know Mrs. Marcus down the street? Yes. Now, she had her living room done. Oh, I've got to have that. <laughs> then dump that green marble. Oh, oh, I've got to have that for borders. Uh, that's from the north of Greece. Again, that's a good value, but expensive. Well, you're really getting worried, aren't you? Those rondels have got to be out of that purple. You mean porphyry cut deep in the deserts of Egypt? That's our most expensive. I want it. Now that marble can be cut and shipped and in your house in Rome or Pompeii or Ostia in six weeks. Now that kind of economic unity would not exist again until our own day. So a global economy and an age of science. It was an age in which Galen wrote his textbooks on medicine that were still used in the European universities of the 16th century. It was an age of astronomy in which Ptolemy, working at a research institute paid for by the Roman emperors in Alexandria and Egypt, sketched out the latitude and longitudes of the earth. Now you say, why do I care that Ptolemy sketched out the latitudes and longitudes? Well, because those maps were still the only real maps available in 1492. Ptolemy made some errors. And by looking at those maps, Christopher Columbus thought that he could reach China pretty easily. So even the, the stakes of the ancients continued to shape our world and lead us to the discovery of a new world. And it was the age in which Roman law gave protection and rights to this whole vast empire. And that Roman law is still the basis of the legal institutions of more than half the world. Isn't that true? Go up to Quebec, you'll be tried under Roman law. Latin America, Germany, France, Italy, even the Japanese law took Roman law when it was recodified as one of its models. So the age of law and a great age of spirituality in which in the pantheon designed by the Emperor Hadrian, an emperor, a poet, an architect, laid the foundations for the great cathedrals of the Middle Ages. So an age of creativity and prosperity. But it fell. Why? Why did that great empire come to its end? And that has been a favorite topic. 
Um, profound historians have looked at it. Edward Gibbon thought it was due to the failure of liberty. The fact that the Roman Republic had failed ultimately sapped the vitality of the empire. Others thought, um, I don't know, uh, climate control, uh, climate change. Yes. Yes, Al Gore would very much like that idea of climate change destroying the Roman Empire. There was also uh, lead poisoning was one of the ideas that Rome, the Romans went crazy uh, drinking this lead poison. And, uh, but it wasn't nearly that dramatic. No empire falls, no nation falls, because of natural catastrophes. A nation fails because of fundamental errors made by human leaders. And the ultimate cause for the failure of the Roman Empire was its involvement in the Middle East. I became involved as a result of a terrorist attack. It first tried just on intervention and then withdrawal. Then it stayed on and tried nation building. One of the attempts to build a nation was in Judea under King Herod, very close associate of Julius Caesar and later Caesar Augustus. But that failed too. And in 6 AD, the leaders of the Jewish community came to Caesar Augustus and said, annex us. So from military intervention to nation building to annexation. And the Romans came with goodwill. They brought their basic tolerance. In fact, they had enormous respect for Jewish traditions. But no matter what they did, they could not implant the fundamental values of Rome, this sense of individual freedom, this sense of Roman patriotism. They could not implant them in the Middle East. Nor were they able to solve the fundamental question of Iran. Julius Caesar knew that Iran was the key to the Middle East. That's what Alexander had understood. No one can bring the Middle East under control unless they dominate Iran. And Caesar, when he was assassinated in 44 BC, was planning a three-year campaign, first to Iran to conquer it, then to swing back by the Caspian and into Central Europe to conquer the Germanic tribes. Central Europe and Iran, those were the keys to stability. But Caesar Augustus was a shrewd man. One of the reasons he was so successful and ruled so long from 31 BC to 14 AD and died in his bed at 77, literally believed by the Romans to be a god, so successful had he been. One reason he was so successful, main reason, was he knew his limits. And he knew he wasn't Julius Caesar. He knew he wasn't a great general. So he made a negotiated peace with Iran. They sat down at the table and talked it out and came up with spheres of influence. But Iran was always there, always a constant threat. And it kept the Romans there in the Middle East and it became a constant drain on their finances. Until Rome, by the late first century AD, was running huge deficits importing both vital natural resources from the Middle East, but also luxury goods. The Emperor Trajan, Emperor from 98 to 117, was determined to start up another campaign against Iran and to conquer the Central European tribes, these fierce Germanic barbarians, as the Romans called them, loving their independence. Augustus, too, had forsworn an attempt to conquer them. But he died. He died trying to conquer Iran. Conquer part of it, then an insurgency would rise up and he'd have to go back and start over again. So he died out there in the Middle East. And his successor, the Emperor Hadrian, decided that foreign conquest was too expensive. And he built that great wall that still stretches across the north of England, the most powerful monument of Rome north of the Alps, Hadrian's Wall. 77 miles stretching across Britain to wall out the barbarians. And he built a similar set of defenses all along the Rhine and the Danube and on out into the Middle East. But you cannot wall out foreign policy. You cannot wall out foreign problems. 